Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Dubin, and I'm the curator for the Jewish Museum Milwaukee. And I am so excited to have you here with us today for uh, what promises to be a really informative, engaging, and beneficial program, we are going to be having a presentation on recycling for good with the Department of Public Works. Uh, and of course, we are offering that in connection with our current exhibit, Scrapyard Innovators of Recycling. So before we get going with our program, just a little bit of housekeeping. If uh, any of you have technical difficulties at any point during the presentation, we ask that you use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and just let us know what's going on and someone from our programming team will do their best to assist you. Also, uh, we'll be doing some Q&A at the end of the presentation and we ask that you use that same chat feature to submit your questions. So, Let's get going and talk a little bit about why this program is so important to us and take it, up, take it from there. So I first of all wanna thank all of you who have donated to our program. So many of you out there have contributed to help us bring important programs just like this one to a broader audience, so thank you. And if you were able to uh, kick in to help us continue to bring these wonderful programs to you, we, of course, appreciate that greatly. I would also like to thank our partners for today's program, the City of Milwaukee Department of Public Works. So I already mentioned that we're offering this, this program in connection with our exhibit. And why did we really want to bring this exhibit to Milwaukee? One of the main reasons is to kind of look at the educational piece and to provide an opportunity for looking at where we as huge consumers of products and as stewards of the planet figure into this equation of purchasing things, looking at whether there are elements that can be reused, repurposed, recycled, what's going to end up in landfills and oceans and thinking more consciously about all of those things as far as our day-to-day -day living and consuming. So We've had a great community response thus far. We've had actually a textile collecting day, an e-waste collecting day, and people have brought in tremendous amount of materials and I know are very excited about the opportunity to learn more about what we can do and, and what can be recycled and, and all of those important things. We at the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee are, uh, a vehicle for dialogue in many ways. And one of the important topics that we address is environmental justice. And one of the central factors of environmental justice is recycling. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Samantha Longshore. Hi, Samantha. Samantha joined the City of Milwaukee Department of Public Works in 2019 as the Resource Recovery Program Manager. She spent the previous eight years as a sustainability consultant specializing in occupant engagement, benchmarking, and building certifications. In her role with the city, Samantha helps develop, administer, and provide education on a wide range of waste reduction programs. Take it away, Samantha. Great, thank you so much, Molly. Hi, everyone, thank you for joining us. All right, so as Molly mentioned today, we're going to talk a little bit um, about recycling right and recycling for good in the city of Milwaukee. Um, and as mentioned, I do work for the city of Milwaukee Department of Public Works in sanitation. And the Department of Public Works provides garbage and recycling collection for all of the one to four unit households in the city of Milwaukee. So that's um, about 181,000 households. 
Um, so, and we'll talk about the um, recycling guide a little bit further, but if you also live in um, the same one to four unit households in Waukesha County or in Wauwatosa, we're all using the same accepted uh, recycling guide. And we can um, answer more questions if you happen to maybe have a different guide or a different service. Uh, DPW also operates two drop-off centers and our own materials recovery facility or a MRF, and that's what you'll see pictured here. That building, um, if you ever are driving on 94, it's between 94 and Potawatomi. So it's that big um, steel structure with Milwaukee recycles on it. So that's where all of your residential recycling goes. And the MRF is jointly owned through an intergovernmental agreement that we have with Waukesha County. So we um, worked together to create this facility when we were both moving to single stream. Um, and it's been fantastic to have a good partner in Waukesha County. And uh, the facility is operated by um, a third party. So Republic is currently the operator of that facility. So we utilized that existing city site and we retrofitted um, the space in 2015. So that's where all of your recycling takes place. And we'll talk a little bit about um, what's on the agenda for today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, China's national sword, which is a policy um, that took place a few years ago, but I think it's really helpful to explain um, the health um, of the recycling industry and kind of how everything that, that we do um, impacts, you know, not only our municipality, but the industry as a whole. We'll talk about what is wish cycling um, and, and why it can be detrimental, what's accepted curbside, what's not, and then some of the hows and whys of recycling. So why we um, ask some of the things that we do. So um, first we're gonna talk about China's national sword policy. And this was a policy again, a few years back um, that banned certain kinds of imports um, such as contaminated recycling. And contamination is basically any unaccepted material. So uh, for example, in a paper bale, um, this might be trash items or even the wrong recyclables. So if um, a plastic um, bottle gets into a paper bale, even though it's a recyclable material, it's in the wrong place. Um, so it's considered contamination. Um, and this really affected the recycling industry as a whole um, because China said, we're not going to take these materials anymore. Um, so a lot of municipalities on, um, especially on the coast, the East Coast and the West Coast here in the US who were exporting a lot of their materials uh, then had to come back home and look for mills uh, that were in the US. So we were affected a little bit differently. Um, I think there were a lot of news stories about municipalities that just stopped recycling altogether. Um, and that's not something that happened in Milwaukee or the state of Wisconsin. We are lucky to be um, supported by a recycling law, but we were affected. Um, and it was typical supply and demand. So the supply of recyclables that everyone wanted to um, get to mills domestically went up, which means that the price for the recyclables went down. So we did see um, a significant drop in the revenue that we were getting for those recyclables that helps offset the program, but we are still recycling all of the accepted materials on our list. Um, so I'm gonna ask just a quick um, true or false question. Um, if I don't know if an item is recyclable, I should throw it into my cart anyway. And this is of course false. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about recycling right. And, and again, this is just sort of help some of the issues that came out of China National Sword, um, but other um, industry issues just with contamination. So when we all moved to single stream, you could throw everything in that recycling cart. Um, sometimes we get a lot of the wrong materials and, and unaccepted materials. So what can we do to help? Um, so it's really important to improve our material quality and lower that contamination by recycling right. And again, so this helps maintain our, maintain our relationships with our mills. Um, so in those situations where everyone now wants to recycle in the US, there's a lot of demand. So it's important for us to uh, maintain our relationships so that they know that the city of Milwaukee is producing good material. And then as a whole, it also helps, again, keep prices high. It reduces penalties, so additional fees that we're paying. So again, it just helps the sustainability of that program and helps us um, offset some of our costs as well. And so two main rules that I always talk about and things that I would love for you to remember uh, if you're gonna take one thing away from this, 
Uh, number one, we always say no before you throw. So check the recycle guide um, before you put something in, know for sure that it needs to go in there or when in doubt, throw it out. Um, and this can be really tough. You know, I think a lot of you are here because you care about recycling. Um, so sometimes we will uh, do something called wish cycling which this is putting non-recyclable items in the recycling bin with the hope that they will be recycled. Um, so it feels better, right? If you're not quite sure, you're like, well, I'm gonna put it in the recycling cart because I think it would be better if it has a chance to get recycled um, as opposed to going straight to the trash. And what I often tell people is that if you're really unsure about a material, there's something that's stopping you from putting it right in that recycling bin, um, that's probably a good indication that 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 product is not recyclable because there is something that's stopping you, right? There's something a little on about it. Um, so what happens when we wish cycle is that again, we get high contamination. So when we're guessing and we're putting the wrong things in the bin, um, you get that high contamination of things that shouldn't be there. And this is kind of an issue and really the cause of, um, not the cause, but certainly a major contributor to international exports saying, we don't want this material anymore. Um, so if we have a hard time keeping that material clean and sorted appropriately, um, that might limit some of our options and those who want to take um, some of that recycled material. As we mentioned, it can drive down material quality, it can increase our prices, um, and also really important is that you pay twice to dispose of those materials. Um, so at our facility, we do pay a tipping fee on the tons that we're bringing into the facility to help offset um, that processing and the operations. And when those materials work their way through the system, um, they aren't sorted because they're not an accepted material. They go out the back end to then be taken to a landfill. So we're really paying for those materials and their weight to come into the facility. And then we're just paying again to landfill them. So it can be really um, inefficient. And I know that this is really difficult um, especially now we see so many different products coming into the market. Um, you know, if anyone's shopping online, you're seeing different kinds of packaging showing up every other day. Um, so it can be really difficult to know what is a yes and what is a no. Um, so hopefully today we'll help answer some of those questions. And um, we typically like to send out the recycling guide um, in the mail. We've done it a couple of times over the last um, few years, but I also wanted to show everyone where you can get a copy of that curbside recycling guide. So you can go to milwaukeerecycles.com and under what can I recycle, you'll see the curbside recycling guide. And we um, have added a few more language for the, uh, languages for that guide. So it's available in English, Spanish, Arabic, and Hmong now as well. So hopefully that um, is helping a few different people. So first we're gonna talk about what's accepted curbside. So these are really simple materials. Um, typically I say, you know, if, if food is coming in them, if um, some of your mail is arriving in them, really they're they tend to be containers and they tend to be consumables. Um, so the city of Milwaukee in your curbside cart, you can recycle your aluminum and steel cans. We ask that you empty and rinse them. I'll talk a little bit about why we ask um, for rinsing later. You can also recycle cartons. Um, so any of your pantry cartons, your fridge cartons, um, you can actually put that plastic cap right back on. So empty, rinse it, cap on, throw it into the cart. Any bottles or jars, just empty and rinse them. Um, if they do have a cap, something like a, a beer bottle with a metal top, that metal top should come off, go into the garbage um, because of that small size and because it's different material from the glass, but throw those bottles and jars in. You can also recycle a wide variety of paper, um, including junk mail. So if junk mail arrives with a little plastic envelope, um, if you know, you know, there's no sensitive information in that document, it's just junk mail, throw it right in. So I say, don't even rip it in half, keep that larger size. Um, that also really helps it to be recycled. And for plastics, um, we accept any plastics that are marked with a number one, a number two, or a number five. Um, so in, Recent years, um, our recycling guide was updated to remove number fours. Um, and again, we removed that because the um, not a lot of 
mills were recycling that product. So not a lot of demand for it. So we always wanna make sure that what's on our list, we know that we can move it and we know that we can recycle it. So for the past several years, it's been the number ones, number twos and number fives. And I wanna talk a little bit about um, the difference between something being recyclable and something being recyclable curbside. Because sometimes there are materials that are absolutely recyclable. Um, it's just that putting them in your curbside cart isn't the appropriate place um, to go. So for example, um, the photo that I'm now showing you here, these are, um, we call them screens. And this was kind of the great innovation that allowed us to move to single stream recycling. Um, so many of you will remember um, in the city of Milwaukee, we used to separate paper and cardboard from your containers. And this innovation, um, you'll see that there are uh, metal rods with a number of these triangular rubber discs. And these spin around really quickly and flat objects like your paper will ride up and over the screens, whereas the 3D containers will fall back down to move to another portion of the facility. So this helped us um, separate those different materials for recycling. But what you're gonna see here is what happens when a lot of plastic bags or plastic wrap comes into the recycling facility. Uh, so they wrap around these um, poles and as you can see, when they get really deep, um, it can stop this equipment from sorting appropriately. And we also have to shut down the whole system to cut these materials out. So um, it stops us from processing materials. Uh, it's not the safest place for people to be to have to climb into there and cut those out. Um, but plastic bags and plastic film can be recycled. Um, it's just that those items need to be taken back to retail programs where they are, um, we call it source separated. So those little bins that are just for your plastic bags, just for your plastic film, and then that helps keep those materials clean and dry um, so that recycler, uh, recyclers uh, want to take those materials from that stream. So another item um, are scrap metals. So for example, um, scrap metal is recyclable, um, but this is another example where if a, a car rotor or a car bumper, which are things that we've seen at the recycling facility, um, when those come in, you can imagine what something like a heavy car rotor will do to this equipment as it's coming through um, and kind of getting tossed around and banging against the equipment. Um, so that's an example of something, again, that is recyclable. It's just important to take that to a drop-off center, for example, where we have roll off containers that are just for scrap. So you can put those materials in, they get recycled um, through the appropriate place. And there are other items uh, like tanglers that we recommend, you know, if in good working condition, perhaps they should be donated first. Um, if not, they should be placed in the garbage. And the photo that you're seeing here, um, every spring, unfortunately, we start to see a lot of hoses that people place into their recycling carts. And again, here is a piece of equipment. Um, this is our drum to the beginning of the facility. And the drum helps to spread out the material that we are dumping into the system so that it's kind of flattened out and ready to be um, sorted and looked through. But you're gonna see what happens when we get things like hoses, chains, ropes, or other things that we call tanglers. Um, again, wraps up the equipment, causes the equipment to be less efficient, causes us to have to shut down to um, provide maintenance. So now we're going to talk a little bit um, about the hows and the whys. So some of the maybe things that seem sort of odd that we ask you to do um, when you're recycling. So one question, true or false, I should crush my recyclables to make them smaller. And the answer to that is false. And so this is, um, I'm glad we have this in here. This is a video showing those discs that I was talking about in action. And you're going to see um, on the bottom kind of right of your screen, this flattened milk jug. And because it is flattened, it is moving up the screens like it is a piece of paper. So again, this innovation, these screens are what help um, us sort the material by shape and size. So um, flat objects, again, are riding up and over and 3D materials are falling down. Um, and so I think a lot of us too, um, had maybe can crushers like are pictured in the garage. 
where we used to take our aluminum into a recycler. So we would crush the cans to save space in a bucket. And then when it was full, we would take it in. Um, but when you're using that co-mingled um, cart outside of your home, you do wanna keep objects um, in their original shape and size. The only exception to that rule typically is cardboard boxes. We do ask that those are broken down and flattened. Um, those are actually one of the first materials that come off of the line, um, but those do help also save space um, in the trucks. But everything else, um, try to keep it the same size. If you're trying to save some space, you can certainly crush down a jug, but make sure that it keeps some of that 3D shape um, if it is a container. And again, that just helps the system to sort paper and cardboard away from the other containers. And um, this is an example of where flattened containers might end up um, if they're in the wrong place. So we saw that flattened milk jug kind of riding up with the paper instead of falling, tumbling back down because of its 3D shape. Um, and once per year, um, at least, we do a material quality analysis. And so this is a paper bale that we cut open um, <laughs> with some difficulty. But you can see that we found um, some flattened plastic containers that had made it into the paper. Um, so again, due to its shape, it had been sorted with the paper, and these happen to be items that um, our quality control teams at the end of the line weren't able to find. So just an example that, um, of how shape and size uh, really matter. And then um, this is an example of uh, 80 tons of recyclables. We were uh, doing another annual test, so we were setting aside a sample, um, and at this point had 80 tons. The facility typically processes around 300 tons per day. So this kind of gives you that look of how much material we're producing all the time. Um, so this is kind of illustrating why um, everyone has moved, uh, well, most people have moved to a single stream recycling where everything is going together. Because when this system um, is up and running, it's able to process so much more material and keep up with the amount of material that we are producing. So if there are any questions, um, you know, such as, well, why do we use those screens if, if a flattened object may go in the wrong place? Um, and really, this is, you know, the innovation that's helped us keep up um, with so much material that we're producing. The next question, true or false, I should rinse my containers before recycling them. And this one is true. I will tell you why. Um, so our, let's see if this will work here. So what you're seeing here is an optical sorter. Um, this is like one of my favorite pieces of equipment because um, it uses lasers to help sort our plastics from other materials. Um, so I often say, you know, recyclables, think of them like your dishes. You know, we, we clean our dishes to make sure that we can use it again. So um, kind of the same concept, let's give our recyclables a rinse if they need it to make sure that we can reuse them again as well. And this optical sorter, um, what you're seeing is that these, um, we have three different sorters and they are looking for the different plastic types to sort them. So you'll see light at the end of that conveyor belt and what it's doing is shining that light over all of these materials that are coming over the conveyor. And when that light identifies the right type of resin, so a number one, a number two, or a number five, depending on which machine you're at, it will then send a puff of air at that material to shoot it up and over into its own bunker. Um, so this is, um, again, just kind of a, a neat innovation to sort those materials, but if a container has some food waste in it, um, some extra beverage kind of left in it, um, that light may not be able to read that material as well. So that's why we ask to keep materials rinsed. And um, what we'll need to know, so this is kind of a, a high level look at the recycling facility and all of the different stations that materials run through. And um, we also do tests every month looking at our residue or all of the materials that are leaving the facility that um, have not been captured for recycling. And what you'll see down below, um, it was always the real mayo bottles for a while, but the clean mayo bottle made it into the number one, the PET plastic, 
whereas the one that was still coated in mayo um, was found in the residue audit sample that we were sorting. So it just sort of illustrates that the clean materials can be read appropriately and get sorted, whereas all the ones that are um, a little mucked up with some of that food and the beverage debris, um, those machines can't read it as well and it could end up going to the trash. Whereas if it's empty and it's clean, I'm more likely to get to the right place. And next, true or false, I should bag my recy recyclables before I put them in the recycling cart. And this one is false. Um, we have another video. I'll just if it's a little loud. <laughs> it, is, it is a little loud in the facility. But what you're seeing here, this is our pre-sort line. So all of the materials are loaded from that tip floor where they're dropped off, where you saw that 80 ton pile and um, spun with the drum that had the hoses wrapped around it. Um, and this is kind of like our first chance. These guys are like our first line of defense to find some of the dangerous materials that come through the facility. Um, so propane tanks are something that should not be recycled curbside. Batteries can cause fires, which we've um, had a few of. Two by fours, the car rotors that we talked about, plastic bags. So this team is looking for some of those materials to pull them out of the stream before they get into our equipment. And so um, your recyclables, just like that picture of all the material, you know, sitting in that pile, it's loose, it's not bagged. Um, we ask that the recyclables are not bagged so that when they show up to the facility, they're ready to be sorted right away. Um, garbage should still be bagged. Again, that kind of helps with litter because that's going to a landfill um, and sitting outside, but keep those recyclables loose in your cart. Um, and there's, it means that there's one less contaminant to grab as well. It means those materials are ready for sorting. Um, and then also helps you know, ourselves and any other companies um, reduced any fees or rejected loads. So typically, you know, bags or bagged recyclables um, are considered contamination. So it's important to keep it loose. It's ready to be sorted. Um, and then also make sure that this team kind of has one less thing to grab. So if they're pulling a bag and maybe opening it to see if there's recyclables inside, they might miss the propane tank that goes by. Uh, so we always say keep it loose. And um, I'll open it up for questions shortly, but also just wanted to leave um, some more information. So again, our website is milwaukeerecycles.com. You can find a lot of information there about uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. And then we also have Facebook and Twitter pages. So you can give us a follow. Um, we'll not only let you know about um, service changes or service updates, but a lot of um, tips and tricks about um, recycling as well. And I'll open it up for questions. Okay, wow. Samantha, that was incredible. Um, just right off the bat, there were just some basic things that, you know, I, I think are just common misnomers that, you know, are so easy and it would be so <laughs> and, and, and easy or simple to correct. So, wow. Thank you. Um, I know I have a few questions, but I want to take some of those that are coming in from our audience here. Um, so th this is a question I have too. Okay, so with our, our bottles, our plastic or our glass bottles, the labels that are on there that are paper, but there's a obviously an adhesive component. What about those labels? Yeah, so any labels on um, plastic bottles are okay. Um, same thing with like your tin cans, how it's a paper label, those are okay. Um, and again, it just kind of comes down to the way that those materials are processed at the mill, um, that basically it doesn't cause an issue for that recycler. Um, what is kind of interesting, and I don't want to complicate things, but unfortunately that's sort of recycling yeah. <laughs> in a nutshell, um, is that, you know, people are, um, manufacturers are producing labels that, um, are maybe different plastic than what's on the bottle. And so we're kind of um, working to keep up, you know, with equipment and upgrades and technology to help us sort them. But for right now, keep those labels on. Don't worry about having to take those off. Okay. So a little bit of a, a connected question here. You, you talked about, you know, things that have food in them that we should rinse those out. Um, the better rinsed 
uh, the easier the optical sorter can can do its job. So uh, we have some question about you know a little bit of remnant. So so I assume if if you know we really rinse it out, if there's a little bit in there, it, it can still get through. Or or is that one of those when in doubt <laughs> throw it out situations? Yeah, a little residue is going to be okay. I saw somebody said they put their peanut butter in the dishwasher. <laughs> I do, you know, I do like a little dish soap and I, I leave it overnight and then it comes off. Um, yeah, so a little bit's going to be fine. Um, you know, there's situations like the, um, somebody asked about like their laundry, their laundry mm -hmm. soap container. They're like, as much as I rinse it, there's still bubbles. Um, and that's okay, right? So you're not going to get everything. Um, but as long as you get the majority out, um, it's really about, you know, that surface. If you look at it, if you're seeing more of that clean surface, then the equipment's probably going to be able to grab that. Right. Okay. So we have a, a couple questions about um, different plastic containers, which, which is, uh, it is a confusing thing here. And I just want to throw in a fun fact that uh, we have a great connection here in Wisconsin. Millie Zantow, who uh, was from Sauk County, she's in the exhibit, uh, actually, was a pioneer in plastic recycling. And she was the one that created that triangle numbered system that wound up being used internationally. So that's pretty cool that we have that connection here in Wisconsin. But um, so again, kind of looking to those numbers, foods, whether they're coming from, you know, sometimes restaurants or, um, you know, just hot items that you can, you know, put in a, a plastic container at the grocery store. Um, Sometimes those have a, a triangle or some type of number. Sometimes they, they do not. Um, if there's no marking, do, do we just assume not recyclable? And yep. uh, that's a, a trash situation? Exactly, yep. If it's no number or a number other than a one, two, or five, that would be a no. And sometimes um, it can be a little tricky. I know this summer I had um, kind of a rigid, and the plastic needs to be rigid. So if you have something like a lotion where it's like a flexible plastic tube, that's mm -hmm. a no. Um, but for example, a sunscreen bottle, couldn't find a number on it, was pretty sure it was a number two and pulled off the cap and on the kind of the inside hidden part was a number two. So sometimes they're a little tricky too, um, you know, so try to try to look in all the parts if you're, if you can, but if you're not finding it, when in doubt, throw it out. Yeah, I was going to ask that because in the PowerPoint, it said, you know, empty your plastic container, re-put the cap on, but I have noted that too. Sometimes on the bottom of the actual container, there'll be a triangle, you know, numbered symbol, but then that top that maybe feels, a, you know, a little bit different and it usually winds up that, that that's not a, a number that can go. So yeah. yes, it can and, be very and tricky. And caps, caps are a little bit different too. You know, so for example, like on a, um, like a number one, like a pop bottle that you might find yeah. or like a water bottle, um, you're probably not going to find a number on that cap, but that's an instance where they can take that material, put it back on, um, throw it back in. And I mean, just to follow up to, you know, that as well, sometimes and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the symbol isn't necessarily on the container itself. Like for instance, I've you know encountered a plastic soda container where it's actually printed on the label itself. So, you know, should we be aware that we sometimes may need to look in other places? Yeah, absolutely. And um, and that can be difficult too. Um, you know, unfortunately we do run into greenwashing as well. So, you know, I same thing I've found like plastic flexible tubes and say, oh, number two, this is recyclable. It'll even say this is recyclable. And I'm like, no, it's not. So always, you know, know before you throw, make sure you've got our guide up on the fridge or right above the bins um, to double check. But um, there there is also a lot of labeling that's getting a lot better. So it might say something like, the box this came in is recyclable. The bag it came in should go to the store. So you're seeing right. a lot of, of good labeling too at the same time. Right. And you mentioned uh, a term there that um, I was dismayed to learn about when putting uh, this exhibit together. Um, so I was gonna ask you about it. You just brought it up. I don't know that a lot of people are aware of greenwashing. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, so greenwashing is basically skewing your information a bit to make your product look like it's sustainable when perhaps it's not. Um, so an example of like that, you know, again, is um, 
actually we're getting a lot of packaging. So everyone's kind of finding, um, you know, different types of packaging that are showing up and it might say right on it, oh, this is recyclable curbside. But that's not always correct. Um, same thing with like the flexible tube with lotion in it. It might say this is recyclable and have a number on it, but maybe in some places it is, but for us it's not. And so greenwashing is basically just being being misleading about your product so that people think it is sustainable and they buy it, <laughs> which is unfortunate. So kind of using, you know, everyone's kind of growing interest um, in the environment and trying to do the right thing and sort of sometimes using it against you. So yeah, unfortunately there are some, you know, ethically shady things that are, are out there and we need to be aware, not just, um, you know, in terms of false, um, you know, identification on packaging, but also, you know, I've been on websites uh, for, you know, companies or products that, you know, really that say we do this, we recycle this or this percentage. But then when you do a little bit of a deeper dive and you don't really necessarily have to go that deep, it's really not always what it's cracked up to be. So right. a little deeper say dive too, sometimes, right? Yeah. And it can seem like a really, a really big issue. And it's sometimes it's really hard to understand how you personally can make an impact. And I always say, you know, much like you vote with your ballot, vote with your dollars. That's what we always say in this household, vote with your dollars. Um, and we're definitely seeing, you know, big product manufacturers making better commitments and making good on those commitments, for example, to use recycled content or to make products in a container that you can recycle and that everybody is more universally recycled. Um, so if you don't buy somebody's product, if you go, I can't recycle this, I'm done, they're going to know they're going to see that change on their bottom line and then it makes sense. So whether you do it to save the polar bears, you know, or somebody does it um, for money, we're all getting to the same place. So always remember you can vote with your dollars too. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, we're having a lot of questions about, you know, different specific um, items and also, you know, specific locations. So um, I guess, can you speak to that a little bit too? Because one of the things that is confusing is there are, there can be subtle or great differences from, you know, county to county, city to city, state to state, um, you know, what may be permissible in one area, five miles away may not be, you know, in another. Um, what is your, I, I assume, you know, the best suggestion would be to go to your, you know, community or, or village's website. Is that what you would suggest too for some of these specifics? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, again, you know, for us, it can even be your neighbor because again, we service, you know, one to four unit households, but right next door, if you have an apartment complex, um, they're going to have a private hauler and, you know, a difference there might, they might say, we take all plastics one through seven. What happens to those, um, you know, might be different, um, but that's, you know, a perfect example. So exactly what you said, Molly, it's make sure that you have your guide, you know, know who picks it up. Again, city of Milwaukee, one through four residences. Um, that's ours. You can find us on milwaukeerecycles.com and grab a list. But if you don't know, again, reach out to your department of public works and they'll be able to let you know. So it might be a guide that comes from a hauler and it might be one that they've um, created themselves, but you're right. That's um, the best action. But also in Wisconsin, because we have that recycling law, there are a lot of materials that are banned from landfill that are gonna be the same everywhere in Wisconsin. So that's really helpful too. So if you look up, you know, Wisconsin's landfill ban, it'll tell you certain materials um, that everyone's gonna be recycling no matter what. Okay, great, great. Um, here's what would seem like, a, you know, maybe we would, off the bat know the difference, but it's a very good question. What's the difference between recyclable and sustainable? Oh gosh. Um, I think it's, I think that's kind of up to everyone's interpretation a little bit, right? Um, so, and again, there are some materials that are highly recyclable. So for example, aluminum, you could, the same can, that same material can be recycled over and over and over again. Whereas paper, um, for example, can only be recycled a certain number of times. Um, so keeping your paper in bigger pieces actually kind of helps that material maintain its durability um, so that it can be recycled more times. Um, but that's a great question. You know, I guess what we always say, like we just go back to it's tried and true. You reduce, reuse, recycle. Mm -hmm. So recycling 
is above and beyond so much better than landfill. Like use something once and toss it in the ground. Um, but the best thing to do is to reduce. If you cannot use anything at all, um, that's that's the most sustainable. If you can reuse something first, kind of keep its useful life as it is, that's that would be next. Um, and then if you can, after that, recycle it. Make sure that it can be turned into something else and used again. So um, I know we've all heard it before because it makes sense and that's the best. So we always say reduce first, source reduction right. is the most sustainable thing you can do in any aspect, like food waste. You know, if you're gonna waste it, compost it. But if you don't have to waste that food in the first place, you know, you can use more pieces or eat those leftovers, That that's the best. So there's always kind of a different scales of sustainability in my eyes. Got it, got it. We've also, I just wanna point out, uh, several people in the audience have posted some sources, uh, some links. So be sure to check those out. We so appreciate Thanks, Casey. that. Uh, yes, thank you, Cassie, too, for uh, for throwing some of those sources up got there. Some DNR love in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to put and and you know this may be an extension of some of the things we've talked about with um, you know remnants of food, but people, several people who've come through the exhibit have asked this as well. You know, cardboard that may have a stain or residue, something like say a pizza box. Um, you know, what about those kind of items? Yeah, so right now, food waste is kind of a no. Um, the rule of thumb that we use for a lot of different things is like something the size of your fist. I know everyone can kind of have like a different size fist, but it gives you like a general understanding. <laughs> so we say, don't try to recycle anything that's smaller than your fist. And the same thing if you have like a paper product or that pizza box, um, if you've got more grease than the size of your fist, you probably need to throw it out. Um, but what you'll see in a lot of pizza boxes is that they're all typically tend to be perforated right at that edge. So you can tear at that perforation. The top is usually super clean, recycle it. The bottom, which is usually full of grease, if you've got a good pizza, throw that part into it. <laughs> good to know, good to know. Um, so one of the things I want to address, and, and there are a couple of questions connected to this, and I, I have to say, you really threw me on this one, that you should throw your recyclables into the large outdoor cart or container loose. Uh, certainly, of course, it's, you know, kind of a oxymoron to put your recyclables in a plastic bag and then put them in there. But, you know, a lot of us do put them in a paper bag and, a, and say, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from the grocery store thinking that's the that's the best way. Um, and you're actually saying, no, no, it's, it's really easier to have everything loose. Um, so, that is uh, kind of blew my mind. But you know, what about something down to as small as somebody asked about, um, you know, documents that have been shredded, which has become a lot more common, you know, with concerns about identity theft and wanting to, you know, keep bank statements or, you know, accounts, what have you, information safe. So we're seeing a lot more shredding, huge containers of shredded paper. What about that? Yeah, so a couple of things there. Um, one, like if you're throwing a bunch of materials into a paper bag, um, as long as it's open, like those materials are probably going to fall out during the process and be sorted away. But again, you know, what I do now is I take things out in a bag and I just dump it and then I reuse the bag. Um, so that would be best. Um, but in terms of shredding, um, so kind of, again, you know, that question, something as big as your fist. And I think that was another question. Yeah. If it's mm -hmm. smaller than your fist, it's very likely um, that it won't be getting through um, the facility. So things like shredded paper, your bottle caps, falls right through the equipment. It's not getting where it needs to be. Um, we say, you know, if something doesn't have like a credit card number on it, a full credit card number, your social security on it, you probably don't need to shred it. Um, but if you do, you know, want to shred materials, put it in a paper bag and give it like one staple to close it um, so that it will move with the paper. But even that, you know, if you can keep kind of like a small paper bag, so it's a, it's like a little bit flatter, that's helpful. But yeah, we get a lot of shredded paper and it just, it, it snows in the facility year round. So. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's my inclination and it sounds like, you know, many in our audience as well, you know, you get junk mail or, you know, things like that, that we think may be sensitive material. It's kind of automatic to think, oh, I better tear that up. Right. And yep. you're saying yeah. no. <laughs> no, just throw right in the bin. And again, it's, you know, it keeps it a larger size. And like we were talking about too, it just helps that paper contain its durability. And that means you're going to be able to recycle that a lot more too. So yeah, if it's like, here, have a phone line, just chuck it right into the bin. 
Okay, okay. And the other thing, uh, big misnomer, the, the idea of flattening three-dimensional items. Um, I, you know, I we kind of, I guess I always thought, absolutely, you, you, you know, you smash the aluminum can or you, you know, you flatten whatever you can um, to make it easier to, to deal with. And you're saying that's actually um, contradictory. It's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's an impediment to the process. To the right. single sort process. Yep. And it's again, it's I think it's a habit that a lot of us learned, um, you know, to hockey puck those cans, you know, because typically we were separating them on their own. But yeah, keeping an original shape and size. Um, so not only in the can situation, not only is it keeping it at a larger size, um, but it's helping keep its 3D shape. Um, and there was actually a question about why do we put the caps back on? Um, and right. part of that is that, you know, those recyclable recyclers can take that material, but also for something like a milk carton, if you put that cap back on, it helps that material retain its shape. So from getting crushed by other materials, that cap back on, um, yeah, will just help it, again, keep it in that 3D shape that we're looking for. So it's kind of helpful on a couple levels. Absolutely. So yeah, a couple more specific questions about, um, you know, differences. And, and again, you know, there are subtle to large differences in, in what different villages, counties, cities um, accept, or, you know, the information that they distribute. So really best to go to your, you know, village or your, you know, your city website and, and get the specifics because they absolutely can vary. And and certainly there have been changes, you know, the, the last time you visited was a couple of years ago. Um, you know, this is, this is a topic uh, and an issue that has continues to evolve on, in, in such a rapid way. So we really, you know, right, you should regularly check that information, see what, what's new, what's changed. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to do a refresh. And I would say too, um, especially after COVID, you know, we stopped doing tours for a really long time, but we're finally getting back to them now. Um, so if anyone has an interest in seeing the facility, um, Keep Greater Milwaukee Beautiful is a group that helps organize um, our tours at the facility. And hopefully next September, um, maybe we'll be back in person as well for Doors Open Milwaukee. So we typically do a ticketed tour for that. Um, but I think it's really helpful to get into the facility and see um, how that process works. And, and it was a surprise for me, you know, realizing that a lot of it is equipment based to be able to move that material through. And, you know, any people that we have in the facility are kind of on that last chance doing quality control, but really a lot of it is automated. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm very excited about it and I couldn't agree more. I mean, just seeing that image or that video of, you know, that mechanism that is the single sort I think, you know, if people, I mean, definitely for me, if I can, you know, I'm visualizing that I'm going, ah, of course, it makes sense that you keep your 3Ds, 3Ds and, and your flats, your flats, because, whoop, sorry, in the dark there, um, energy, you know, sustainable lighting. <laughs> <Love> um, <it. laughs> um, but it's so helpful to be able to visualize because I think it helps you to digest and understand. Uh, and then it becomes kind of more second nature. Some of your, you know, the decisions you make um, absolutely was the case with scrap. Uh, we had a mention earlier that scrap can be sold. And, and of course, you know, that's the kind of the focus of, of our exhibit. One of the, you know, the focal points and there are, you know, still uh, everything from large corporations to, you know, the, the little guy who's going around and, and collecting whatever he can to come in and, and sell and salvage whatever raw commodities can, can be salvaged. Um, I am going to ask this question. I, I know this probably goes to visit your, you know, website, but we, we see about regularly that you can't dispose of medicines. Oftentimes you'll hear of, you know, villages or cities designating a special day for people to come in and, you know, give their, their ex, the medicine, you know, that they have around the house or the, the scripts that they have. Um, what about those, those containers that those scripts come in? Yeah, it's um, so typically those containers are going to be a number one or a number five. Um, they're like the orange ones typically are a number five. So you can look at the bottom of those and see if they're marked. You can recycle them. I know some are a little bit 
um, smaller, so they kind of verge on like, is it a fist or not? But you know, some of the smaller pill bottles still go ahead and throw them in. Um, and you know, that's unless, um, and again, I think most take back programs, you know, so your police departments, fire departments, sometimes your local pharmacies will take those, um, but they do often, I think, ask you to put it in a plastic bag. So you probably do have that container, but yes. So if those are marked and most of them are, they can be recycled curbside. But the, the body of the bottle itself, not necessarily yeah. that white cap <laughs> or sometimes. Those, nope. Plastic containers, put that cap back on. That put that cap back on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That is great to know. Um, okay. I think we've kind of consolidated and, and asked most of our, our questions here. Um, again, you know, to those specific questions or, you know, what is, um, you know, what can be recycled in different municipalities, definitely uh, look those up. Um, and, and maybe this is a question we needed to ask Millie Zantow, but but why not, you know, a three or a four in that in that triangle sequence? Right. And it's it's really about um, kind of the durability and the recyclability of that product. Um, the number ones and number twos really highly recyclable banned from landfill in Wisconsin, um, you know, because you there are strong markets for them. They're easily recyclable. They're valuable. Um, number fives, we still recycle for the same reason. A lot of people want that material. You can move it. It's durable. It can be recycled multiple times. Mm -hmm. When you get into your threes, your fours, your sixes, your sevens, um, not as recyclable, not as many uses for those that they are recycled. And so there just isn't a lot of demand for the, for those materials as well. So it's really all about, you know, who wants it and what can they do with it? And so if there, you know, if there isn't somebody who wants to recycle it or can recycle it, then there's kind of no, no path for it. Okay, so a couple more questions I'm gonna uh, ask here from our audience. So uh, this, this is a, a, a good question here when you're talking about plastics and recycling and rinsing things out. Um, what about a container like a plastic bottle of, you know, a WD-40? Or you know, or you know, some type of uh, oil container that may have remnant of a, I assume, flammable material, possibly. Yeah. So those definitely keep them out. Um, I would really recommend, and um, if anyone's in Milwaukee County, um, take a look at MMSD or the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. <laughs> it's a mouthful, um, but they have a household hazardous waste. Um, program. And so if you look up like Milwaukee hazardous waste, um, they, uh, one of their um, facilities is at our drop-off center on the south side on Lincoln. So they're open on certain days and you can bring some of those more hazardous materials. And so there's a list, but it, you know, it can be your pesticides or some of your paints or, um, you know, your sealants, that kind of thing. So um, take a look at their, oh, thank you again. <laughs> Perfect. The link is in the chat um, and that'll, that'll help you again, look at um, some of the different locations that they serve and the materials that they accept. But yes, thank you. Great question. If it's got something, if it doesn't smell great, like don't put it in. <laughs> it's like a great. <laughs> good, good recommendation. <laughs> so a number of questions geared toward plastic and, and rightfully so. Um, this is a, a horrible, horrible issue. Um, so looking for a couple recommendations. There's a suggestion of a, a documentary, The Story of Plastic, but really asking that question of, do you have a recommendation on how we can reduce single-use plastic? And is there a way, and I think we'd all love to know this and that may be connected to that greenwashing, you know, that you can't get all the information or, or all the most truthful information, but, um, you know, are there ways to, to ensure that, you know, the, the plastics that we are um, able to recycle are are being utilized and used to make other products. Right. Um, you know, and again, for us, it's following our list. Like if you give us a one, a two, a five, it's being recycled. If you're buying something that's not accepted in your program, you know, we're telling you to send it to landfill and, and that's where it's going to go. So that kind of goes back to, um, you know, on our Milwaukee Recycles website, we have a reduced challenge and it's, it's rethinking some of those things, you know, like your straws or your to-go cups or mm -hmm. your plastic bags um, and just giving ideas of how you can replace those. Um, so trying to find reusable products um, 
you know, as an example, right before COVID, it's kind of got a little bit unused in my car, um, but I put a, a glass storage container in a reusable bag and I keep it in my car. And so when I used to um, go into restaurants more frequently, I take that with me. And you feel a little bit silly sometimes, but then if you have to go um, items and you're at your table, you can just pour it into that container and take it. Um, so sometimes you feel like a little goofy doing it because maybe it's it's not done all the time, but the more that everyone else does it, the, the more commonplace it is. So, you know, I say, look in your trash sometimes too. Do like a little self audit and be like, what am I throwing out the most? And maybe how can I rethink this? And what can I change to try to avoid it? And maybe it is bringing a container or um, having a reusable straw that you can wash um, or bringing bags so that you're not grabbing plastic or just finding out that a material, you know, isn't made out of a recyclable plastic and trying to find an alternative at the store um, that you can recycle. Um, so it's, it's really just sort of about thinking about what we have and how can we change that up? Yeah. So kind of a, a connected question there. Um, refill services. Um, are, are there recommendations or, or sites uh, that we should be looking to in, in terms of refilling, you know, I, I guess that would go to, for example, uh, you know, a pen where instead of <laughs> you're throwing it away, maybe, you know, it's reusable, you can refill it. Um, of course, during the pandemic with things like, just for example, Starbucks, uh, you know, many of us frequent Starbucks, and to get away from getting, you know, items to go in that that plastic cup, you know, you're, you're going to a reusable one that you can bring in. But during the pandemic, that was really suspended in many ways. And, and hopefully, you know, we're steering back into that. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? And, you know, are, are we headed back in a better direction with some of these issues that came up during the pandemic? I think we are. I think it was particularly helpful, you know, that more studies were finding that COVID wasn't spreading on materials as much as it was spreading through the air. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you know, a lot of grocery stores now too are letting you reuse your own bags now. Um, but I, you know, I also know in a lot of restaurants, you know, where I used to go and say, hey, just throw that burrito in, in this container that I brought you. Um, sometimes with health clubs, they don't want to take, you know, something from a customer, bring it behind the counter and use it. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and that just might, you know, be based on code. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's worth asking the question in different places that you go. Um, and I know, I think we are going back to, you're seeing more groceries going back to bulk options mm -hmm. that you can fill up and, and you do need those containers and um, more companies that are coming up, you know, like with refillable shampoos or soaps or that sort of thing too. So I think we're heading that way. Um, I think everyone understands, you know, that reduce is important. So I, I do see the direction kind of heading that way a bit more in different industries. That's that's terrific. And, and I think that kind of segues ways into the last, I'm gonna consolidate these, which, which really um, are people offering resources for places where you can, you know, purchase recyclable cups or, um, you know, retail establishments that offer refillable options. Um, is there a way, I mean, is that on, you know, the Milwaukee Recycles website or is, is there a place where you can, you know, look to find out what are, you know, the businesses in our communities that maybe have refillable options or, um, or are very much, you know, mission-based recycling yeah. organizations, businesses? Well, right. We don't have any kind of database like that on our website. Um, what we we do have kind of a database of places where you can donate and what types of items you can donate, um, but not kind of companies that are doing um, refillable or you know bulk that that sort of thing. Okay. Any any place in particular that you would just highlight? Are, are there any great examples of you know businesses or initiatives in in our community that you want to give a shout out to, or or you've encountered and you think are really great? Yeah, um, I think none that you know that I can name um, you know specifically or <laughs> kind of um, <laughs> just here at the government. You know, there are a lot of people that are doing good things, um, yeah. but um, I think we're you know we're seeing that in a lot of different places too. Um, you know, you'll kind of find at the, um, some of our arenas and our sporting events that they are, you know, looking at mm -hmm. introducing programs where they can wash their cups. 
um, instead of just having you throw them away. Um, so I, I think we're seeing a lot of new providers that are thinking um, more intuitively about that. So not only kind of seeing it in individual stores, but also some of those kind of big gathering spaces where we all come together and use a lot um, as well. I think we're seeing a lot popping up there to provide a service where there used to be a disposable product. Okay. So obviously there are ebbs and flows and, in, in, you know, involved with all of this. Um, and there are certainly events that, that play into um, whether things are, are going in a more positive direction or are stalled for whatever reason. Do you feel like we're headed in a more positive direction or that there um, is being more concern voiced with really wanting to be informed and be part of the solution? Yeah, I think absolutely. You're, and I mean, you're seeing it. Um, I think what I find most interesting is that you're seeing, you know, these major investment firms. So you're mm -hmm. seeing it in the financial industry saying, you know, if you are not thinking about climate change, if you are not thinking about sustainability, which really is a good business practice, right? So sustainability is just making sure that what we have, we have it in the long term. Um, so I think you are seeing a lot of major players taking these things into account. Um, and again, you know, specifically we're most affected by a lot of those, you know, big brand owners. So your Coca-Colas and your Pepsis yeah. um, and your Kroger's saying, yep, people want it. Shareholders want it. The people that are buying our products want to see it. So I think that we are creating a lot of demand. Um, it's, you know, kind of the individual is, is grouping together and it is working, but I think you are seeing, um, a change where people are demanding it and you know those manufacturers want you to buy their their products or you know use their services so i think it really does matter and i, I think we're moving in the right direction so again it's like it's using those dollars yeah, <laughs> it might be a different exactly. perspective you know but polar bears exactly and that's that's the way matter. to get to you know to, to get the message through to those big companies you know it, it's all about the the buck as you said you know and you know if there's louder voices out there about wanting, you know, packaging that can be recycled or, you know, commodities and products. Um, yeah, that's the way Whatever to do it. Whatever our reason is, it's that's all, the, all the it. same place. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, wow, Samantha, I just want to thank you. I, I think we could probably stay here for many hours. Um, I think it's incredible that there's, you know, so much genuine um, interest and in wanting to be informed about, you know, how to be part of the solution. So thank you so much for being with us, for sharing all of this knowledge, for giving us all of these fabulous tips. Um, and so we, we, of course, encourage you to, to look at the website for uh, the Department of Public Works and, of course, Milwaukee Recycles and, and check out your, your community and municipality websites and, uh, and be sure you're up to date informed on, on what all the, the statutes are in, in terms of what can be recycled and, and how to do it effectively. So thank you so much. So appreciate yeah. it. Um, this is all part of the exhibit that we have going on. So if you haven't come in, uh, we would love for you to come and visit us and, and check out Scrapyard Innovators of Recycling. And I would also like to just plug a couple of upcoming programs. We do have some other great programs. There's that, uh, you know, sustainable light there. Um, <laughs> conserving of light energy. Uh, we do have some great other programs connected to the exhibit. So we encourage you to look at the website. The things uh, coming up most soon on January 12th in the evening at 7 p.m. We have the next in our Global Museum Passport virtual uh, museum series, which is a tour of the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum, which we're very, very excited about it, as you can imagine scheduling that with the time difference was a challenge. So we're, we're excited to be able to do this with you, the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum. And then we have a great virtual book talk coming up, uh, getting back into uh, the theater, which we're glad is swinging in uh, a positive direction, public theater, having audiences go in to see those shows. So we have a connected book talk, The Jewish World of Alexander Hamilton with author Andrew Poor watcher. So um, 
I think he's going to be debunking some some different myths and looking at the fact that in all likelihood, Hamilton was born and raised Jewish. So some really interesting programs that we encourage you to join us for. And uh, as Cassie, thank you, put in the chat there. There's a link to all of our upcoming events so you can check it out. Thank you again, all of you for being with us, for supporting us, for contributing to help us continue to bring you these important and hopefully really interesting, engaging programs. So thanks everyone so much and have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone.